We did a very clever experiment, I, in my opinion, that was invented by my friend Q. So everybody calls it the Q experiment, which was to put biological cells in a system and see if they acted like diodes, which in a scientific sense means you want to find out if they're nonlinear. Okay? So one of the things about that is that if you expose biological tissue to a typical cell phone frequency, if the biological cells are nonlinear, you should be able to see the cells generating what's called the second harmonic. This is twice the frequency of the bomb that's went in. Because if they can't be nonlinear to go up in frequency, they don't have the nonlinearity to go down and do the demodulation either. So we built a system to do this experiment, and this is where I'm going to tell you a little bit of science. Basically, you could think of this as a rather specialized microwave oven. We had an antenna in the bottom that fills this big gold-plated cylinder with microwaves at 900 megahertz. In the middle of this cylinder, by the way, there's a lid goes on when it's being operated, we put some biological cells in a petri dish in the middle. And then there's an antenna in, near the top of this microwave oven that's tuned to pick up any of the 1800 megahertz signals that might have been produced by the cells being nonlinear. Okay? And we made two of these. One of them we kept at the University of Maryland, and the other one went to the Health Protection Agency in the UK, where they had all the biologists who looked at all the different tissues to see if they could see anything. And so it's a very simple experiment, actually. You know, you take a signal and you drive this microwave oven, which scientifically I'm calling it a microwave cavity. So there's microwaves rattling around in here. And if the cells that are in the middle generate these new frequencies, they come out and they're measured. And we had a very sensitive experiment to do this. Okay? And we checked this very, very carefully. And to prove that it worked, if there was something nonlinear, we could actually put a little object in the middle of our system, a thing called a Schottky diode, which is a fundamental little electrical device that's nonlinear. And indeed, if we put one of these in the middle of the cavity, we could see these second harmonic, higher frequency signals being generated. And I think I'm going to skip through these scientific sorts of pictures, because these were just saying that we didn't see anything. Okay? But this actually shows the system inside an incubator in the UK. And these are just some examples of some of the cells that they put in it, human fibroblasts, human neuroblastomas. And lots and lots of cells were tested in this system under biological conditions, you know, 37 degrees C, the right amount of carbon dioxide, and all the careful things that biologists do to make cells comfortable. And we saw nothing in any of these experiments. And we had incredibly good sensitivity. I mean, look at all the things that they looked at to see if anything happened. Human lymphocytes, blood cells, mouse bone marrow cells. These are various kinds of cancer cells, okay? Skin tissues, more cancer cells, Chinese hamster ovary cells. Why they study these, I don't know, but they're very popular in the biological community. And all kinds of tissues, brain, kidney, muscle, liver, you name it. Lots and lots of tissues, all checked, all kept happy, all looked after very nicely, and they looked to see if they had this nonlinearity property. And we've not detected anything. In fact, I think our sensitivity, our ability to see something was so many gazillion down below what you might have thought if there was anything significant going on, but I don't want to go into... And this, was, this is the, the paper that's actually just been published. It's been submitted for ages, but you know how slow the publishing process these days. So this is the title, and there's quite a team. You know, my team from the University of Maryland, people from the Health Protection Agency in the UK, and this is one of the journals that publishes quite a lot of these attempts to find biological effects from radi radiation. And, of course, it also publishes some of the papers that claim they find biological effects. So you've got to be able to distinguish the good from the bad. There's a very comprehensive report came out recently from the Swedish Radiation Safety Authority. And this was an international group of scientists evaluating all the evidence, looking at all the literature. And they concluded 
There's no evidence for any health effects. So this was a massive and comprehensive survey of what was known. Okay? Of course, cell phones can be a hazard to your health. Maybe some of you heard about this one. A guy left his cell phone in McDonald's, and he had nude photographs of his wife on the phone. He called the restaurant and he said, hold that phone until I come and pick it up. Before he knew it, pictures of his nude wife were up on the internet, extracted from the phone, and he filed a $3 million lawsuit. I don't know what the consequence of the lawsuit was. And, and that's the end. I'll be very happy to take more questions. <laughs> Yes. Some years ago, I asked my cardiologist if carrying a cell phone in the shirt pocket would have any effect on the uh, pacemaker. His answer was, no, it's not turned on. That's a very good point. We've studied that as well. Some of the early pacemakers could actually be upset by putting a cell phone very close to the pacemaker. Because the pacemaker has some very sensitive electronics, and it actually had the ability to act a bit, act a bit like a radio receiver. And it was occasionally subject to interference from the cell phone. The newer pacemakers are designed so they're not subject to that kind of interference. The study that we did in conjunction with the FDA a few years ago was we were looking at, you know the magnetic security gates that they have in department stores so you can't steal the stuff? Well, we were looking, did the magnetic fields from those security things that you walk through leave in the store, could they, could they upset things like pacemakers? And what we found was that they don't upset pacemakers, but they had the potential to upset neurostimulators. So if you have a little implanted device that stops you having epileptic seizures, there is a remote possibility if you walk through the magnetic security gate, the thing will misfire and you will collapse in a heap on the floor. If a cell phone or a security gate upsets a pacemaker, it'll only make your heart maybe miss one beat and you probably won't notice it. But these days they've made these devices much more immune to this kind of thing. But there were instances, there was a case, somebody in a wheelchair on the rim of the Grand Canyon, and somebody using a cell phone nearby caused the wheelchair to suddenly take off on its own and head toward Because electronic equipment does have the ability to do these demodulation things that I was talking about. And it is a known fact that cell phones can interfere with stuff. I mean, that's why they tell you to turn your cell phone off when you're on a plane. I mean, I used to poo-poo this to some extent, but they've got documented evidence that in rare circumstances, the signals from the cell phone can upset some of the sensitive navigational and, you know, and equipment on the plane. It's not very likely, but of course, the other reason they don't want you using your cell phone is they'd like to sell you cell phone service in your seat. It's a very high amount of money. But, you know, RF devices can interfere with other things, and that's a continuing thing that people worry about. But I'm very convinced and that they don't interfere with humans. They might interfere with electronics, but we're not the same as electronic circuits. We actually tend to run rather more slowly than most electronics. Yeah? Just a couple of questions. Uh, could you comment on the fact that uh, all carriers and all uh, handset manufacturers in the package when you buy a new cell phone has a warning uh, to not use the cell phone within two centimeters of your body. In other words, do not place it up against your ear, but to hold it two centimeters away. Well, you know, I actually have not seen that warning in any of the cell phones. In every single phone, there's 1.2 billion phones sold a year, and it's in every uh, package of every phone sold worldwide. Well, if that's the case, and I must admit I've not seen it, if posted in every Verizon store, I would say that that is just an irrational response to this public paranoia, and the cell phone manufacturers are trying to assuage people's irrational concerns by telling them to do something that really makes no sense. There was a report that came out in the UK a few years ago called the Stewart Report, and it came up with this conclusion that cell phones were fine, but maybe not for children. But the point is, they're no more dangerous for children than, are, than they are for anybody else. But, you know, people get very touchy-feely and they say, oh, we've got to worry about it. Why would that not be the case? We, uh, a cell phone generates a certain amount of energy, i.e. Uh, RF radiation. The energy is absorbed into the brain. You, you 
suggested that, right? That's absolutely true, a small amount. Percent of the total energy when you're using the thumb is absorbed into the brain. Now, if the, if the skull of a child is thinner than the skull of uh, an adult, the penetration level uh, is significantly greater in a child than an adult. Would you agree with that? It's I mean, not, it's I, not there, clear, there, but well, even no, if you... No, wait a minute, it is, yeah. it's very clear. I mean, uh, I've seen numerous studies that show the depth of the penetration. Name one. I'm sorry? Name one. I'll be happy to name one. For example, yeah. I, I'm familiar with the many studies that have gone on. So, some studies, I'm very familiar with people looking at the difference between children and full-grown adults, and they do the modeling for children, and they do it for full-grown adults. Now, children have thinner skulls, they have smaller heads, but the tissue in their head is very similar in its electrical properties to the tissue in an adult head. And the fact is, if the radiation penetrated further, that would actually mean that you would have less exposure, because it's concentration of the radiation in a small volume that raises the temperature. Are you all familiar with this new weapon that the Defense Department's developing? using millimeter waves, all the energy is absorbed just in your skin, and it makes you feel as if you've been burnt. They're using it for crowd control. It doesn't actually burn people, at least they claim it doesn't. The fact is that there's no mechanism in a child or an adult for this radiation to do anything, because the heating, if there is some, it's very tiny. A child gets a fever, it's going to be much, much hotter than if it uses a cell phone. What I would suggest that anyone that would like to at least uh, take a look at an alternative view would be to go to a website called pongresearch.com. There's about 20 or 30 studies that are cited there with a number of um, uh, citations in terms of who produced the study. Uh, there's a doctor live at the University of Washington that has done extensive studies on this. Uh, I'm very familiar with, uh, I, I don't know whether he's your boss or not, Dr. Uh, Liu, and I've traveled to um, um, China and ex explored some of these issues. Uh, so I, I, there's a Dr. Alfred Wong, who's Professor Emeritus of Plasma Physics at, the, at UCLA, has done extensive studies on this that totally um, counterbalance uh, some of the, I'm, I'm a businessman. I'm not. Well, let assigned. me just stop you for a second. And I, so I can't. I, I can't really get into a. I'm not denying that there are people out there with positive studies, but I'll tell you, there are probably a thousand studies that show nothing, as opposed to a few tens of studies that claim to show something. I think that's totally incorrect. Uh, the Interphone study uh, among 26 different countries in Europe couldn't come within 10 years. Couldn't come to a conclusion. And it was, uh, it was and, and remember, Interphone was funded 70% by the carriers and the handset manufacturers. So you, you have to understand where these studies are funded and what the conclusion, the predisposition for conclusions are. This is a multi billion dollar industry out there. And uh, you know, for us to just automatically assume that because the protocol for these studies are designed to produce a specific result, and then they produce that specific result, we should just sit back and say, oh my gosh, if, if you know, uh, I came here just by chance. It was, there was a, there was a um, um, advertisement for this meeting in Starbucks, and I just happened to see it, so I'm totally unprepared scientifically to refute anything you say. But I, I think it's so unfair for you to uh, just totally dismiss without any recitation of corresponding evidence to the contrary. We just uh, did give you corresponding evidence to the contrary. Well, but let, let me ask your question, but let's, let's ask this, let this young man ask his question, and then I'll come back to yours, please.